Welcome to the Clinical Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Here in our PCRF Journal Club, we promote evidence-based practices by critically evaluating the latest science in emergency medical services. We hope our discussion will help advance EMS practice. Through the generous support of our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO, we are able to make science more accessible and understandable. All right, welcome everyone to the October 2023 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Thank you again to our sponsors, Limmer Education and ESO for allowing us to be here today. I am joined by Dr. Tony Fernandez and Michael Caduce and Dr. Bill Toon. And we're also very fortunate to have with us today the author of our paper, Future Doctor, Dr. Tanner Smita. And the name of the article that we're reviewing is a retrospective comparison of the King laryngeal tube and IGEL supraglottic airway devices, a study for the CARES surveillance group, which was published in Resuscitation. And as always, this discussion will be paired with an article written by our very own Tony Fernandez and Michael Caduce in EMS World called Journal Watch. Uh, so I encourage you to check out the article at emsworld.com under education and training. And thank you all for joining us today. I can see we have a big crowd. So let me remind those of you who might be new to this journal club that you can use the chat feature on your screen and type in questions, comments as we go, and we'll bring those into the conversation with us. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Tanner Snita. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we kick off, I think it's always interesting to hear a little bit about who you are. So we'd love to hear who you are, what you're doing, what's your EMS experience like, how'd you get into EMS research? Sure. Uh, so, so it was a little bit of a of a winding path. Um, initially, I, I didn't even want to want to go into medicine at all. I wanted to be a, a microbiologist, so I wanted to do entirely laboratory work. Um, but then, while I was a, an undergraduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, as an elective credit, I took a, an EMT course through their Center for Emergency Medicine there and just totally fell in love with emergency medicine. Um, and then and then after that, um, there are some some wonderful EMS researchers that that primarily study cardiac arrest resuscitation there at the University of Pittsburgh that um, introduced me to the world of, of EMS research and uh, the rest is history. So now I'm a MD PhD candidate at West Virginia University. And so I'm hoping to um, specialize in the future in emergency medicine and then on the side also continue to, to do emergency medicine and emergency medical services research as well. Well, we're certainly glad that you chose EMS or maybe EMS chose you. A lot of us have that windy path. Nobody necessarily went direct to EMS. So I love hearing that story. Um, but we've got some exciting research here on the table. So I definitely want to dive right in and talk a little bit about you know, what was the objective? And we'll talk about why you took on the study question. So first things first is that this study was comparing neurologic outcomes, important words there, of cardiac arrest patients who were either managed with the King LT, King laryngeal tube, or the IGEL. Um, so what got your brain turning on this one? Why did you decide to look at these two devices? Sure. Um, so it, it actually all started, um, we'd done some work previously with the ESO data set looking at, at vital signs. Um, and one of these papers looked at um, pulse oximetry and the association between hypoxia and hyperoxia and outcomes following cardiac arrest. And as a sub-analysis uh, within this paper, we looked at the odds of hypoxia and hyperoxia um, by the different airway management strategies that were captured within the ESO data sets. Um, so obviously endotracheal intubation, but then also supraglottic airways. Um, we noticed that you know the the vast majority of supraglottic airways contained in the in the ESO data set and used in the United States were the king laryngeal tube and the eye gel. And so we noticed in the subgroup analysis that there were some differences in um, post oxygenation between these devices. And so it kind of got us thinking, you know maybe maybe this is associated with differential ventilation effectiveness and maybe downstream outcomes. Um, so we, we did a paper with ESO examining that question. We found that use of the IGEL was associated with um, better survival to hospital discharge, better ROSC, better first pass success uh, in comparison to the King laryngeal tube. Um, and so that, that kind of led us to this data set that has more complete neurologic outcomes scoring to, to explore this question. Absolutely. And there's 
so much nuance to airway management strategy and, and perhaps it's not as focused on as you know a lot of our cardiac arrest methodologies but ventilation and airway is so important so I, I think it's really important that we also talk about you know what's the difference between these two devices i have a slide here for those of you who are watching the video version of this um, that just shows what the two devices are. Now, a lot of us in pre-hospital setting are familiar with them, but it's probably worth taking just a second to summarize, you know, the key differences between these two devices. Sure, yeah, so, so uh, they basically have the, the same indication. They're used for the same purpose. They're both blind insertion airway devices. Um, they can both, they both have um, ports for orogastric tubes that can decompress the stomach. Um, but so, so one key difference between these two devices. So one, the iGel does not have uh, an inflatable cuff. So basically, the at the very um, a distal end of the device, there's a thermoplastic elastomer that kind of conforms to the airway anatomy once it's been heated, um, and so and so you, it basically ventilates in that fashion. Um, whereas the the king laryngeal tube has two cuffs on it, so one that inflates in the oropharynx, one that inflates in the esophagus, and then you ventilate through uh, channels in the device between these two cuffs. Um, so that's the that's the the main difference between these devices. Right. And so it's good to have this. And they've both been around, like you said, for a long time. King was probably on the market a little bit before IGEL, um, but both very widely used, which sets us up for a perfect natural experiment, if you will. Um, but before we dive into the methodology around that and what a natural experiment is, let's talk a little bit about the data source, because you mentioned that you did this study in the ESO data set, but this data source was actually distinct. This was in the CARES data set. So could you tell us a little bit about what CARES is? Sure. So, so CARES stands for the Cardiac Arrest Registry to Enhance Survival. Um, and it's a collaboration between Emory University and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that's kind of designed to uh, look at out-of-hospital cardiac arrest epidemiology in the United States and monitor both outcomes and, and you know, can be used to assess the association between outcomes and different uh, clinical treatments and, and clinical characteristics. Um, and so, you know, there are over 30 states that participate in CARES. Hundreds of thousands of cardiac arrest cases have been enrolled in this registry. Um, and so, so not only is it, um, you know, has a geographically wide reach, uh, it also has, it's very complete with respect to all of the covariables of interest. So it has complete neurologic outcome scoring um, and, and even complete data with regard to, um, you know, things like in-hospital treatments that are provided like therapeutic hypothermia or PCI. Um, so it's a very powerful data set for looking at epidemiology, epi the epidemiology and outcomes of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the United States. Absolutely. And so I think that is a distinguishing factor for CARES is that it's a true registry, meaning that there's a human that goes through records and it's not just your EPCR data directly imported, but that, that there's some human interaction with reading through and looking for missing data, reading through some of the narratives in some cases um, and getting that more complete data set. And then having, of course, the hospital outcome data is key. And we'll talk when we get into the methods about one of the outcomes that you used, which gets at neurologic outcomes. Um, but another, a couple of other key things here is we talk about NEMSIS on this podcast a lot and how we have a national EMS data standard. And, you know, sometimes we have to check boxes that seem weird or, or don't, you know, exactly, wouldn't exactly be the way that we would say the element. Um, but it's worth noting here too, that CARES has a standard data dictionary and this data dictionary has been incorporated into the EPCR. And in some cases, CARES and NEMSIS are perfectly aligned and that's intentional so that we get the best data that we can on these cardiac arrest da data elements so that we're you know, able to compare apples to apples across organizations. Um, another piece that I wanna highlight out of here is you mentioned that you used a public use data set out of here. So for our listeners who may be interested in, you know, what was the process like to get access to this kind of a data set? Sure, so it's, it's basically as simple as an email. So if you go on the, the CARES website, they provide you with a PDF form, um, and, and on that form, if you're interested in doing research, um, you basically um, put in all your contact information, you enter your, your research question, your plan statistical analyses, um, and then basically that gets sent off uh, to a review committee that works with CARES, and they can approve or deny projects or request revision. Um, and then if they, if they deem that a project is worth doing and the question can be answered using the data captured within this registry, um, they then basically just send you, a, send you the data that you've requested for as many years as you request with the variables that you ask for. Um, so it was a very simple process, very, um, very easy, and they were great to work with. 
Yeah, and I, I think this is an important piece of, you know, we do spend a lot of time as field clinicians checking these boxes and to have organizations like CARES who make these data available to researchers is a really important part of making sure that it's not just checking boxes to check boxes. This can truly advance our knowledge of pre-hospital care. Um, and of course, there still needs to be institutional review board. We talk about IRB. All of that remains very important. But in this particular data set, I, am, I have not personally used CARES, but I'm going to guess, and you can correct me, it's completely de-identified. So the IRB process is less involved when we're dealing with minimal risk to, we call them participants, but to patients in this case. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So we basically just had to uh, submit a brief form to our IRB describing the data set. They classified it as not human subjects research. And it was like, it took like a day uh, to, yeah. to get approval. So yeah. yeah. And I think that's an important distinction because we we joke about the IRB a lot and, oh, it's miserable. It takes forever. It's not always the case. And in particular, when there is minimal risk, like in this kind of case where it's de-identified, no patient information is um, available and you can't link backwards. So um, that's great to hear. Now, I'm going to invite Dr. Tony Fernandez to come join us because I know we, we want to get to the results, but we always talk about methods first so that everybody stays on board with us. Um, so, Tony, let's talk a little bit about some of the details. We did talk about the data source being CARES, which I think is a really important starting place, but I'm going to toss it over to you and let's dive in a little bit more. Well, great. And again, I want to thank you so much for joining us today to discuss your work. This is uh, some really important uh, data that I, I'm really excited to go through. So, <clears throat> excuse me, as we always start to talk about, we start to talk about the setting and uh, the, the study period. So we'll start with the, with your study period. And you you looked at data from 2013 to 2021. And again, you used the CARES registry and you made it pretty clear how uh, useful this this and robust this data set is. So uh, in, your in your method section, you quote that by the end of 2021, the data that covered a catchment area of about 170 million people. Uh, this included 30 statewide registries and 45 municipalities um, from and 45 communities, excuse me, from uh, an additional 16 states. There were 2,300 EMS agencies and 2,500 hospitals uh, combined uh, in the data set. So can you, I mean, that pretty much speaks for itself, but can you give us a, a little bit of an idea of how, um, easy it was for you to make the decision to use this data set based on how robust it is. You're on mute. Sorry about no that. No worries. I think, so I think that, yeah, I, I think that um, the, the CARES data set is an obvious choice and it's the you know holy grail for anybody doing observational cardiac arrest research. As long as you know the whatever question you're interested in answering is contained within the limited set of variables that, that the data set captures, so the registry captures. Um, so again, the, the reason that we decided to take this additional step is um, in our, with our previous ESO study, we didn't have neurologic outcome data, which is you know the most patient important outcome, right? People want to survive and go home back to their families, back to their lives. It doesn't necessarily matter to them if they survived it you know, leave the hospital, but are, you know, in a vegetative state. Um, so we really wanted to get that neurologic outcome data. And that's why we moved to CARES. Yeah. And I think that's the, it's a great decision. Um, certainly you have the data there and you had to make, you couldn't just use the data set as it exists, right? You had to make some exclusions to answer your questions. Um, and you made some exclusions based on, uh, obviously if an eye gel or a king was placed and also, if patients, uh, you excluded patients who achieved ROSC uh, after bystander CPR uh, only. And I think that was a really wise decision to kind of narrow your data set. Can, can you kind of walk us through that a little bit, that decision? Sure. Yeah. So, so you know, I think for EMS providers listening, I think we've all, you know, arrived to uh, the, the scene of a 911 call where someone has been reported to be unresponsive in cardiac arrest with CPR ongoing. And then when you actually assess the patient, they do have a pulse and it ends up being an opioid overdose or, you know, a septic person or, you know, somebody who doesn't actually require chest compressions and was probably never in cardiac arrest to begin with. Um, and so, you know, we, we made this choice basically just to exclude patients who we felt were probably not in cardiac arrest at any time. Yep. And I think that was a wise choice. And as we go through, it's really important to kind of, as we go through and talk about your results to get on the same page in terms of definitions. Um, and you have a lot of, a, a few definitions here in particular that I think it's important to talk about, um, particularly how you classified shockable rhythms. Um, and obviously you, you used uh, V-fib or V-tac, which makes a lot of sense. 
Um, but you also use um, shock any shock delivered by EMS uh, with an AED prior to arrival. Um, and I think that that was, that was also why it had to be a shockable rhythm. Um, and you use that same kind of the reverse of that to define non-shockable rhythms. Not only did you have PEA um, and asystole, but you, any, if an AD was applied and the shock wasn't delivered, um, you called that a non-shockable rhythm. And that's, um, I, th I thought that that was really interesting. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, why you didn't just use kind of VFib, VTAC, and asystole and uh, PEA like you'd see in, in some other studies? Sure. So, um, you know, I think there's a there's several papers out there now that have shown that um, rhythm transitions are pretty common during um, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So, you know, the person that's initially in PEA, and then you give them a bunch of epinephrine, and they end up in, you know, VFib or VTAC. Um, and so we basically wanted to have a nice clean definition and look at the initial rhythm that was documented by EMS. So if a, if a firefighter got there and put on an AED and defibrillated, and then, you know, EMS got there, put their cardiac monitor on, and it was PEA for a little bit before, you know, they gave a dose of epinephrine and got ROSC. Um, we still wanted to classify that as a shockable rhythm because that was the first documented rhythm by any EMS responder or first responder or EMS provider. Yep. Uh, and I love that choice. Um, a few other definitions that, and some of them are intuitive, right? You classified um, patients as witnessed uh, arrests, bystander witnessed, or 911 uh, responder witnessed. And you obviously identified the the locations as private residents, public nursing homes, or and others healthcare facility. But I do want to talk specifically about your response time uh, or your response interval definition and um, your definition of of ROSC. Uh, can can you kind of walk us through how you define? Well, first let's talk about response time interval um, and and what those two time periods that you use to um, to make that definition. Um. So so. Oh, I have the paper here to reference. Um, I believe so you the, went the from problem. EMS dispatch to on scene time, um, and and I want to just like that that that's uh that captures the total time for the patient, and I thought that that was really interesting um, because the patient calls nine one one right, and that that's that's what they're considering on response time, um, but there's some debate here and there about whether on response time should be when the EMS unit was notified. Um, so kind of, can you walk us through why you thought it was important to capture that dispatch time? Sure. So, so I, I think that, um, so, so that you also, there's also time intervals in there that sometimes get missed, uh, the, the time it takes for the EMS providers to actually walk to their ambulance and, you know, report on the radio that they're on route. Um, you know, so, so we wanted to make sure that it was, a as, as clean a definition as possible also. Um, yeah. So, so I guess that's our, that's our main reasoning. And our ROSC you defined as, uh, 20 consecutive minutes of uh, spontaneous circulation. Um, and oftentimes you'll see Ross defined as, well, we got the heart beating again. Um, can you can you walk us through some, uh, how you came up with that definition as well? Sure, so, so that's the, the CARES definition of Ross is 20 minutes of consecutive um, spontaneous circulation. Um, so that, that's basically what we had available to us to define ROSC. Um, in, in previous studies that we've done, um, especially because our group has an interest in re-arrest, we haven't always used this definition and basically just, you know, any pulse documented by EMS providers or any blood pressure documented by EMS providers, we would consider that a ROSC. Um, so this is just kind of a peculiarity of the, the CARES data set. Um, and it's, it's, you know, commonly used across the EMS literature and clinical trials and other things. So. Yeah, I think absolutely. this one's worth like digging into a little bit because it is tempting just to go with any pre-hospital ROSC. Um, and we do know, in fact, from some of your research looking at re-arrest, that it's not all that uncommon to experience a re-arrest. And so I, I think the intent behind this measure is to look at that sustained ROSC as a sign of likely to continue to maintain ROSC upon ED arrival um, and not require further resuscitation. So, and there's probably a lot of factors that affect that as well. I think uh, as an as an industry, we had, we've advanced past this load and go mentality when it comes to providing resuscitation, but um, there is that, you know, you feel a heartbeat, oh my goodness, time to move versus are there some things we can be doing on scene to stabilize and reduce the risk of rearrest before we begin transport even. And, and I, I would like to note in our um, ESO study comparing the King and the IGEL, um, we did define ROSC as any documented pulse or blood pressure. And we did find 
um, a, a significant difference between the king and the IGEL, whereas in this study with this different definition, we found no difference. Um, so, so it could have relevance to our, our findings as well, what definition we use. Absolutely. And for those of you who are in the field filling out you know, EPCRs, this is probably one of your data elements. And so I mentioned there's the interaction with nemesis variables and CARES variables, and there's several different ways to indicate that a patient had ROSC. And this is where um, things can feel like I've already documented that, but it is really important to capture the nuance between sustained ROSC and then a ROSC that may have resulted in rearrest. Um, so always worth looking at those and thinking critically as we're documenting in the field because it does have a big impact on how we answer questions like this one. Absolutely. So I I want to, I know I'm holding folks up from the most interesting part of this, which is the results, but I think your analysis is really sophisticated. And I think it's really important for folks to understand that you ran a logistic regression model where you were able to adjust for age, sex, um, the calendar year, if the rhythm was shockable or not, whether it was witnessed or not, um, and whether bystander CPR was administered as well as the location. But you also adjusted for EMS aid, the treating EMS agency, and um, you did that in in a really interesting and sophisticated way. And uh, I, without diving too deep into what a mixed effects multivariable logistic regression model is, um, can you can you tell us how you treated EMS agency in your analysis? Yeah, so so we treated uh, the the so basically with the CARES data set. Every EMS agency gets assigned a, a random identifier. So basically, it's a number one through 2300 or however many agencies are included in the data set. Um, and so we included agency identifier as a, as a random intercept in our multivariable logistic regression equ equation. And so basically, the, the, what this is designed to do is adjust for confounding that's introduced by um, agency characteristics. So for example, some agencies might um, serve a, a catchment area that has more patients that present with non-shockable rhythms, uh, for instance. And so the, you know, those patients are obviously going to have worse outcomes. And so it kind of accounts for clustering of, of um, characteristics within agencies. I mean, I think, you know, again, the EMS providers, you know, most of us in EMS have worked for multiple agencies, and I don't think it's a surprise that, that some have better outcomes than others, um, even, even due to things like, you know, uh, logistics and, and operational constraints that are unique to systems and their administration. So. Yeah, and even though you did that and you included that in your analysis, which I think was a really important decision, um, you went further and you did some sensitivity analyses. Um, can Can you talk to us about how you slice and dice uh, for your sensitivity analyses. Sure. Yeah, so, so I think that, that sensitivity analyses are, are important to conduct um, because I, it, at least me, whenever I, I read a study, I have more confidence in a result whenever the, the directionality is consistent across all evaluated subgroups. Um, and, and, you know, just from a pragmatic standpoint, I think it's important that we ensure the generalizability of our findings, right? So, you know, if there's an intervention that's helpful for non-shockable rhythms and harmful for shockable rhythms, we might want to be kind of, um, picky about how we dole out this intervention. Um, and so basically we just repeated our, our logistic regression analyses and subgroups defined by um, age, sex, initial rhythm, witness status, whether or not they received bystander CPR. Um, and one that you mentioned before, we actually looked um, by year. Um, and so one thing that we were a bit concerned about is because the King was available on the market before the IGEL, and we were concerned that, you know, as agencies kind of get better at resuscitating cardiac arrest patients, and then in, in some, some studies, there's trends in improvement and outcomes over time. We wanted to make sure that there wasn't like a, you know, kind of a cohort effect here that was just making the IGEL look better because it's being used more, uh, more in the contemporary time than the, than the, the King LT is. Um, so, so we... Um, it, it's some of our subgroup analyses. We looked at every single year that the King and IGEL were both used um, within the calendar year. And we found that um, that there was a difference, uh, a consistent difference every single year that these devices were used together. So does that, does that answer your question? Absolutely. And it also helps really if the, the naysayers or, or the critics that would say, well, you included the dreaded year 2020. Um, so having it separated out and did COVID affect how pieces of plastic work? Um, probably not. <laughs> and if any, perhaps we saw an increase in use of these devices trying to minimize time on aerosolizing procedures. Um, so I, I think it is nice to have that out for a multitude of reasons, including the early cohort effect. And then, of course, with pandemic and airway protocols changing, very helpful to see that. 
Yeah, and, and I think that, um, so, so I don't recall off the top of my head if there was any huge jump in 2020 with regard to one airway device or the other, um, but definitely across time, the use of superglottic airway devices was increasing um, within this data set. And it appears in recent years, the use of the eye gel was increasing faster than the use of the, the king laryngeal tube. Yeah, I, I think you did a great job uh, identifying and, and implementing the methods. Um, I think this is a, a really high level sophisticated study. I'm, I'm really interested in uh, preventing, stopping from preventing, from getting us to the results. But I do, before we move to our results section, I want to open it up to the rest of the panelists to see if there are any other methods questions uh, for this paper before we get to uh, these really interesting results. No questions, but I do want to highlight a real strength of this data set in having the CPC scores, the cerebral performance categories that allows an extra layer on top of this to say it's the gold standard in terms of the outcome we always wish we had, but so often we don't have it. So having CARES as this kind of resource to give back to the EMS community and explore these questions is really key. So just major kudos and excited to dive into the results on this one. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean Please. Sorry. Um, so, so one thing um, when it comes to, to observational research that I think is really important, especially if there's people watching that are interested in getting into EMS research, um, one of the one of the biggest problems is, especially in you know this this is a big problem like cardiology research and a lot of research with medications that people are on, uh, but is confounding by indication. So, so for you know a lot of times people might administer a treatment because of some because of clinical gestalt or some clinical characteristic that that patient has. Um, and so this might lead to kind of wild baseline imbalances and, and inaccurate data from, from um, observational data. And so one thing that I think is, is nice about this question is that, at least in my experience, EMS providers don't have a lot of choice when it comes to which superglottic airway they're choosing. Your, your agency either stocks the King LT or it stocks the IGEL, right? Um, and so it's just wh whatever you have on scene. Um, and so I think that makes this a, a good question. Um, and again, again, there's still a lot of confounding, still retrospective, still observational. We might not be accounting for all the, the relevant variables, but I think this is a, a uniquely good question to ask using retrospective data for that reason. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I think when you're you know, starting a study like this, you really need to think hard about your question and if there's confounding that you can account for versus you can't because of you know provider choice. Well, I think that confounding by indication is so important. And, and this one does set itself up nicely for a traditional natural experiment where some agencies happen to carry this device and other agencies happy to, happen to carry the other device. Um, whereas, for example, for you know sedation of a patient with severe agitation, I probably carry Versed and ketamine or Versed and another sedative, and I might reach for ketamine given more severe agitation. And so I couldn't compare those two medications as easily as I can do something where I have a device or I don't because it doesn't make sense to carry both. In most cases you're getting, you know, from a vendor and, and there's discount, there's no reason to carry both of these devices. I agree with you. Um, so I, and when we get to table one, we'll highlight it here too, that a lot of those factors kind of even even themselves out naturally when you have so many agencies as in this large study. It's hard to do if you're just comparing, you know, one or two agencies, but on such a large scale observational study like this one, uh, the factors, those confounding variables sort of even out. And where they don't even out, you've used statistics to help rebalance the equation and make it as if it were a randomized control trial. Um, and of course, you know, this, this is early work that might say, hey, maybe we do need a randomized control trial on this. But before we invest all that time and energy and resources, having observational data is very, very helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about some limitations later. I have some things in mind, but I'll, I'll save it for the limitations. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> there's always limitations, plenty of them. <laughs> Well, I will stop holding us from the results. Um, I, again, really appreciate your work, and thanks for being here to talk to us about it. Um, and, yeah, let's let's dive in. All right, you got it. I've got us teed up. We'll move into figure one as we discuss, you know, we talked, this is a really big research data set, and having this many cardiac arrest patients in one place is rare and, and something that should be very appreciated because at an individual agency level, you know, most agencies don't see a ton of cardiac arrest a year. It's a small proportion of all of the cases that we see. Um, but in this data set over the study period, 
there were over 736,000 cardiac arrest cases that were ultimately assessed for eligibility, and many were excluded for a variety of reasons, including that neither one of the devices of interest were used. So remember, endotracheal intubation still exists, um, and there are other devices that have been studied in, uh, elsewhere. Um, but we did see that there were over 167, almost 168,000 patients who did receive one of the two devices. Um, and I, I don't know if you looked, Tanner, if there were uh, patients who received both devices, but I would suspect that that's not a thing. Um, but in this case, it was vast majority or majority got King LT 126,000 versus 41,000 with the IGEL. And you already mentioned, but perhaps worth reiterating that over time, this mix may have actually changed. And in your previous study, you looked at uh, 2021 or 2022 data, and we saw that the IGEL was the more commonly used. So this is just another case for why that cohort analysis, that sensitivity analysis you did by year was so important. One thing with regard to if, if patients receive both the, the IGEL and the King. So CARES, I believe, only documents what airway the patient actually received. So it doesn't have like all of the um, attempts documented as ESO would. Um, and so, yeah, it, there, it was mostly, you know, one or the other. Just their final successful device. And that makes total sense. And, and that's actually a question I have coming up is talking about, you know, what happens if we're using it as a rescue versus using, you know, first line device. Um, but before we dive into that, let's talk a little bit about patient characteristics. We talk, figure one is traditional here. It's the flow of who is in, who is out. And that helps us put a critical eye as consumers of research on, you know, is there so much missing data that I should be super concerned? Is the sample size too small? In this case, I think both of those are resounding. It makes sense. The numbers here are very high and will allow us to see even if there was a small difference. Um, so that passes gut check. And then we can move on to our table one, which is traditionally the baseline characteristics of populations. And in this study, the authors did a great job at splitting between the two exposures of the two variables that we're interested in. So having a column for the King LT and a column for the IGEL. And I'll let you take the first swing, Tanner, if there's anything that you want to highlight in this table when we get to compare some of the baseline characteristics. Sure. So, so I think, you know, even just starting out here, um, it, it appears that most of the baseline characteristics are, they're fairly well balanced. Um, so just looking here, I think the, the largest difference um, is in bystander CPR with an absolute difference of 4.8%. Um, and so, you know, the, these groups are, are fairly well balanced, even at baseline before we apply our um, statistical methods. Absolutely. And so I, I think it is worth taking a look, okay, if, you know, paying attention to which group would be favored with these characteristics. And then obviously it, these factors were included in the model based on prior research that shows that by, things like bystander CPR and early access to defibrillation, all of those things make a difference in outcomes. Um, we do have a question from Nathan, I think it's worth bringing in right now, which is, we talked about agencies were given randomized numbers from CARES, agency one, two, whatever, um, but is there any data available regarding the region where these agencies were located? Um, and if so, were there any differences noted by geographic region? Yeah, so just having having read um, some other papers that have come out of the the CARES data set, I believe that there there is a way to determine um, geographic location, um, may, perhaps even down to the like census level. Um, but because that will, the, the, I didn't request any geographic variables um, prospectively, I didn't think about them. I don't think they were provided to me. And and in order to get them, you might have to directly work with the CARES people um, because then you run into I think you'd run into some more problems with um, you know the de-identified nature of this data, if you can get to that resolution. Absolutely. And I haven't personally worked with the CARES data set, but in NEMSYS um, and in the ESO data set, there, uh, there is a certain level of geography provided, but in order to maintain de-identification, that level of granularity only goes to the census division. And the census division is an aggregate of a few different states. So I don't remember if it's like three or four different states, um, but can get at some regional variation and, you know, perhaps worth investing. But investigating in a future study, but in this case, the question I'd ask myself is, do I think that the association within the Northeast would be different than the association in the South? And I'm not sure that I would expect that unless we thought temperatures or weather might affect these devices, um, or 
uh, some sort of system designs that's very common in one region versus the other, but that's a, a really great factor to think about, you know, in upcoming work as well. Remley, it made me think um, regionality. California has a large population. If we were to roll out the IGEL on a statewide basis, we could actually impact those numbers, um, probably just because of the surrounding states having such a smaller population. That was the only thing that came to my mind where regionality may play a role in it, depending on who rolled out what when. Uh, we'll see that come out in the results. Uh, uh, Tanner, I, I wanted to point out, um, you, we sort of have the best population of people that have a survivability here. And I think that was a great job in your methods of picking the population you wanted to look at. Um, by standard CPR is hovering, I think you averaged it, it's 37.8%. I, I think sometimes it's the nuance that comes with these studies, like, well, that was, wasn't what we were looking at. I think that's huge as we look at our public education, we certainly have more room to go, um, but only about 8% to 9% got public use AED. So as I'm thinking of the educator in me, what do we need to continue doing for continuing education, public education, um, continuing to push out CPR classes while this number is higher than what's typically presented in, in the, um, you know, with the American Heart Association pushes out. Love to see this number of people getting by standard CPR um, prior to EMS arrival. It is interesting to take a look at how things like bystander CPR, another factor that is not necessarily a part of this, but I've seen in other recent resuscitation work is the use of end title. You know, 10 years ago, end title was not you know, a common vital sign, especially waveform end title capnography. And now I see bulk of agencies participating in the CARES registry are, are routinely using waveform capnography. Um, now, we do have another audience question here to bring into the conversation from Diana. And Diana is talking about BLS versus ALS. So in some areas, uh, IGEL might be a BLS procedure, whereas in other areas, and this can be at the county or even the state level, uh, placing a supraglottic airway is an ALS procedure. Could that have possibly played a role in any of the results that we're going to see? Sure. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, in, in West Virginia, um, the placement of supraglottic airways is a BLS skill, but where I originally started in Pennsylvania, it was not. So um, that, that is definitely a, a factor that could come into play. Now, I, I will say that the majority of these patients did end up receiving ALS care, um, you know, when, when you look at like epinephrine administered and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a factor and, and one that we did not look at. Excellent conversation. Keep the questions coming. Um, some of the things that I want to highlight are the, the lack of findings in table one, for instance. A lot of these measures were just really well balanced by the natural experiment itself. So things that I would have been really worried about are, oh, was there a big difference in the age of the patients where one device was used versus another, or in um, who had a witnessed versus not witnessed arrest. And you can see that um, these are all really closely aligned and, you know, that is luck if you will have it, but um, very important to take a look at in table one. And um, the next thing I'm going to take us over to is we'll just hop straight into the adjusted outcome. So I'm gonna move over here to table two and we'll talk through, what do we see? So remember all of those variables that we talked about in table one, the things that are known to influence cardiac arrest survival besides the device type, these are things like age, sex, the year of the study or the year that the cardiac arrest occurred, um, the initial rhythm, witnessed bystander CPR, response intervals, where it happened, all of that is taken into account with the with the results that we're about to see. So Sandra, I'll give you the punchline here and you can walk us through, what did we see in terms of your outcomes when it came to comparing the two devices? Sure, so, so in, the, in the last slide in the unadjusted analyses, it looked like there was about a 1.3% difference in neurologically favorable survival favoring the, the IGEL. Um, so then once we uh, performed our adjusted analysis, so again, we're adjusting for all of the, the Utstein factors that we know are associated with out of hospital cardiac arrest survival, um, the difference persisted when we're looking at favorable neurologic outcomes, that's a CPC of one or two, survival to hospital discharge, uh, and survival to hospital admission. Um, however, for our outcomes of, of ROSC and rearrest, there was no statistical difference between the devices that was discerned. Yeah, and I, I think, again, you mentioned, oh, well, maybe the way that ROSC was characterized is different and that intermittent ROSC versus sustained ROSC uh, could have different effects. 
but having, and, and that's why having the hospital outcome data in the study is so important because it could be tempting to conclude, oh, well, there's no difference in just pre-hospital ROSC, so uh, there's nothing to see here. But when we get to that gold standard outcome of CPC score of one or two, meaning neurologically intact, we see a 45% increase in odds. And we talk on this podcast a lot about logistic regression and how to interpret these odds ratios. So again, an odds ratio of one means that there was no difference found between the two devices. In this case, any odds ratio greater than one favors the eye gel. And so what we see here is that with an eye gel compared to a king, 45% greater odds of neuro intact survival, which is a really important and really big finding. And then of course, you know, this is a signal that doesn't tell us the why behind it, but that's gonna be the next natural question is, what are your thoughts on around why we might be seeing this finding? Is it really the plastic? Is it something else? Is it who's using it? Um, I know that this got really heated on Twitter, which is always exciting or X. Um, but I'm curious about your personal thoughts on this. And again, beyond the scope of a peer reviewed paper, but this is hypothesis generating for the next set of peer reviewed papers. So, so I think I'll, I'll start with something that has data behind it and then move into pure speculation. So <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, in, the, in, the, in the ESO paper, uh, we found that the IGEL was associated with much higher odds of first pass success, right? So basically first airway attempt was documented as successful by the EMS providers. Um, and so it could be something like earlier oxygenation and ventilation that is the reason why we see better outcomes with, with the IGEL. Also in that initial uh, ESO paper, we were able to look at, at vital signs, um, including end tidal CO2. And so we found that uh, with the IGEL, patients were more likely to achieve an end tidal CO2 threshold of greater than five millimeters of mercury and greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, so, so first of all, just focusing on this five millimeter mercury threshold, that is a threshold that has been used previously in studies of supraglottic airway devices, a threshold for failure. So basically, if you have a successfully placed device, you should always have an end tidal CO2 greater than five millimeters of mercury uh, during CPR. Like there, there are studies out there where they innovate cadavers that have been frozen for, for days and then, and then um, put an advanced airway in and you get end tidal CO2 is much higher than five. And so the, the, the fact that with the ISO, you get you know, slightly more patients that have uh, an end tidal CO2 greater than five. So just that there might be more unrecognized airway failure in the King group in comparison to the IGEL group. And airway failure, I mean, during a cardiac arrest, I think it's, it makes sense that that could worsen outcomes. Um, so so, so those, are, those are two reasons that are backed up a little bit by data. Um, also, um, so, so there have been some studies in, in animals that have looked at uh, basically impingement on uh, vasculature in the neck. And so basically compression of um, the, the veins and some impingement on the arteries as well, they can decrease cerebral blood flow as a result of inflation or maybe even overinflation of the cuff on the, um, on the king laryngeal tube. So it's possible that cerebral blood flow restriction during CPR, or even in the post-ROSC setting, um, that, 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 could, that could be influencing outcomes. Um, and so... And then, and then, okay, so, so that's all the things, that's all the reasons that the, the king can be associated with worse outcomes. Um, one thing that, that I talked about on a, on a previous podcast, um, why the IGEL could actually be improving outcomes is the differences in leak pressure between the two devices. Um, so it, one thing that, that a lot of people complain about in reference to the IGEL is that there's, you know, with a lot of patients, you get an air leak, right? So you, you can't deliver the, the ventilation pressures that you want to, um, because if you, you know, if you squeeze too hard, if you deliver too high of a pressure, um, that, that thermoplastic cuff kind of um, separates from the paralaryngeal anatomy and you get an air leak. And so this is touted as a negative very often. Um, but one thing I thought about is it's, it's, you know, we talk a lot about the harm of hyperventilation during, during CPR and how that can increase intrathoracic pressure and decrease uh, coronary perfusion pressure. And so I think it might be possible. And again, this has no data behind it, pure conjecture, needs some animal studies and, and, and clinical work. Um, but it's possible that maybe the lower leak pressures that the IGEL has is, is protecting patients from you know, the overzealous hyperventilation that we know occurs um, in the field. Um, so, so that's my thoughts on why these could kind of be leading to differential outcomes. And I think that's important to have the hypothesis generation because it's probably not any one variable. We so often want this to be, well, it's got to be this and, you know, that's the answer and it never changes. But research is a very iterative process and we're constantly learning. So having a study like this that directs us to, hey, there's something to see here and starting to think through, well, what are the differences in the devices and what are we seeing? 
Uh, this also reminds me of an NAMSP blog post from not too long ago, but uh, interviewing people who decided to implement the IGEL in their agencies about their experiences and you know what they noticed differences in terms of um, a couple of the things that came out were uh, sizing. Is it easier to pick one device size over the other and get the right size? Uh, another thing that came up a couple of times was the need for extra hands and the inflation, the extra step of inflating a cuff or not doing that. Um, and there were just a lot of good considerations there from the field perspective of if you're going to implement this, and especially if it's a rare procedure. So again, we tend to gravitate towards thinking about that urban agency that has you know, multiple cardiac arrests per month. But what about in rural settings where uh, this isn't as common? You know, is one device easier to maintain competency on than the other? Um, so, and I know Michael Caduce will probably hop in here with some comments around training, but I, I think that's another important consideration when we're talking about real world and not in a controlled hospital environment is, you know, which device might be easier to employ. Um, and then this also puts some pressure on the device manufacturers in terms of, are there things in the EMS setting that could be adapted? Uh, in that in AMSP blog, one of the things that stuck out to me was packaging. <laughs> and it said, oh, the IGEL's packaging is really bulky. It takes up a lot of space. So should we call on our packaging colleagues to think about how we're doing that? Um, and then the other part was securing the device after placement. Uh, and the that's evolved over time, but these are also considerations with each device. Is there a way to make sure that we are securing it and that if it does get dislodged that we're noticing? Uh, I think uh, the way we use devices is incredibly important as we look at science and rollout. I was also thinking what every time, because there's a new iPhone out right now, right, that there's always the early adapters and the innovators that pick up a technology first. Um, and usually they know everything and absolutely everything about the device. Um, I, as we transition to table three, uh, I think this is debunked fairly well in the fact that i would sort of consistently proven this. So I think through in my mind, well, is it just the early adapters that are just really good at this? They place it all the time. They use a whole bunch of it. Um, I'll let Tanner share uh, what, what's in table three, but it really debunked my training methodology and the, well, we just did a whole bunch of new training. Everyone's going to use it. And then it went out the window when I looked at table three. Perfect transition. So let's hop into table three. And Tanner, you can tell us, uh, I, I know what Michael is, is referring to the year of the cardiac arrest, but um, feel free to highlight, you know, the points that you want to look at first, and then we'll dive in. Sure. Um, so, so I think the, the main takeaway from this table is that um, consistently across almost every subgroup that we evaluated, um, the the IGEL uh, seems to be the, the winner between the two airway devices with regard to um, cerebral performance category of one or two. So that's the favorable neurologic outcome um, kind of metric that we've been talking about. Um, there, there are two notable exceptions. So people in a uh, that were treated for their out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in a nursing home or healthcare facility, there was no difference between the two devices. I think that's probably because overall having a favorable neurologic outcome after having a cardiac arrest in the nursing facility is just very, very rare. So it's tough to, to tease out any difference there. And um, then also in patients less than 18 years of age. So first of all, there were very few um, pediatric cardiac arrests in this data set relative to adult out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. And then also in this pediatric population, um, neurologic outcomes seem to be less common. Um, and so that, that might be just a problem of statistical power, the reason we didn't see um, a difference in those groups. Um, and then... I'm sorry. I actually, I think that's a that's a great segue into an audience question. So on age, it's often hard to study pediatric cardiac arrest and then to get the magnitude to compare devices. Um, but there, there's a question regarding a, a possible recall on pediatric airway devices with King. Uh, I'm not personally aware of that, but certainly something to keep eyes on news around, you know, do these devices work the same in younger age groups? And I'd argue that under 18 is a really broad age group and, and probably a big chunk of those patients were over the age of 15 and have anatomy that more closely resembles that of an adult patient. Um, so, you know, not just taking all the results as a lump sum is, is a really good point to pick out here as well. Yeah, and then also, again, we, we talked about the, the results um, looking at outcomes by year uh, comparing the two devices. Um, so again, in, in every evaluated year in which both at least one King and at least one IGEL were, were used and enrolled in the data set during that, um, during that year, the, the point estimate favored the IGEL every year, 2016 through 2021. And I think that consistency is important. And this is why we shouldn't be 0.05 level people, as we would say, um, you know, well, it's not statistically significant. So it means that the other one doesn't work. 
no, there's still a trend within the point estimate. Yes, the 95% confidence interval was too wide to make a conclusion regarding statistical significance, but the repeat of the point estimate always being higher than one favoring IGEL lends some belief to, oh, okay, this is a consistent finding over time, whether or not statistical significance was reached. And, you know, taking a look at 2016, IGEL had just come on the scene with 61 cases that year, and we can see how it increased year over year from there. I'm thrilled that you did this analysis and actually I'm reading the ESO paper, the same thing, but um, I wanted to point out in 2020, we actually saw an increase, a little bit of a decrease in 2021. My my speculate, complete speculation on this is we were doing less intubation, especially early on in 2020 in the beginning of the pandemic. So for the people out there that don't like to look at COVID data, um, I would say this actually only continues to support the analysis that they may be doing less intubation and more IGELs um, actually only goes to prove that this is effective in cardiac arrest management. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Tanner, but I thought the, the sort of the jump in 2020 and then a slight decrease in 2021, while still significant, um, might have been due to less intubation and more IGEL placement, which only helps prove what you're saying. Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I, have, I have no argument with what you're saying. I think that's a, a reasonable hypothesis. Absolutely. And I think that's something just to watch trends over time. And I don't know that we dug specifically into it, but perhaps now's the time. Um, talking about first line airway management versus a rescue device. So in a lot of systems, first line may be with ALS on scene to try an endotracheal tube. And if the first or second attempt fails, switch over to a supraglottic device. Were you able to account for that either in this study or your previous work? Um, and what are your thoughts about how using a supraglottic as a first line versus a rescue device may influence the results. Sure, yeah, so so we were not able to do that uh, in this study because um, as I mentioned before, they only recorded basically the, the device that was used to quote unquote like definitively manage the airway. Um, so however, in the, in the previous ESO study, we were able to uh, determine basically who received a supraglottic airway device following an endotracheal innovation attempt and we classify those as, you know, rescue supraglottic airways. Um, and so for our for our primary analysis for the paper, we basically um, included all comers and we included whether or not the patient's airway was placed as a rescue or a primary airway device. And we still found a significant difference in favor of the IGEL for, for all of our outcomes that we assessed. However, in a secondary outcome, so when, when we basically recreated this table three, except for that paper, when we looked at only patients who received uh, their supraglottic airway device as a primary device, and, and then also as a separate analysis, only patients who received um, their supraglottic device as a rescue device. Um, we did not find a statistically significant difference in favor in the IGEL when we were just looking at primarily placed supraglottic airway devices. Um, now, now, the IGEL was still significantly better when we looked at first pass success, still better when we looked at ROSC, but we lost its statistical significance with regard to survival to hospital discharge and discharge to home. Um, Again, that could just be a power question. The point estimate was pretty similar to all of our other subgroups and it still favored the IGEL. Um, I think the question I would ask for people that really point to this is, is there a reason why, um, you know, it, it could be better in patients receiving a rescue device, but not better in patients that are receiving it as a primary airway device? Um, I, I can't think of any convincing physiology, um, but it's, I mean, there's always a, a potential that that's the case. You know, maybe these patients are more hypoxic and so it's easier to see the effect size or, or more hypercapnic. Um, but that, that yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if in timing, you know, it's quicker typically to place an eye gel. And if we had, if we're not doing delayed sequence intubation, we'll bring Jeff Jarvis in, um, channeling our inner airway evangelist. Uh, if we're not reoxygenating and providing that and we're going from attempt to attempt, is it that they're getting more ventilation more quickly with one device over the other, potentially? Um, which I think brings us to an important consideration. Now, I, I have that unpopular task of getting us almost wrapped up here. But one thing that we should probably talk about is, well, what do I do with this? You know, one study is one study, two studies are two studies. Uh, do I throw everything away? and just move over to IGEL. Now, this is important. None of us are funded by IGEL or King. I have no conflicts. You have no conflicts, Tanner, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, so I think that's an important strength of the study too, is you know, anytime there's industry funding, raise a critical eyebrow. It doesn't mean that it's a bad study, but we always raise a more critical eyebrow. In this case, none of the investigators was funded by any of the device companies, but does an observational study like this and the previous study mean that we should just throw the baby out with the bathwater, everybody switch over to IGEL, 
or you know could there be some other potential confounding variables that we should still take into consideration regarding how we're using devices when we're using devices and those kinds of things what are your thoughts Taryn? Sure. Yeah. So, so I think, uh, you know, especially with observational data, we should always be our own biggest critic, right? We should always be thinking about all the limitations that are inherent to our data. Um, and so I think one of the, one of the big problems with this is um, that, that I think applies to pretty much all research when you're comparing interventions or, or medications for cardiac arrest um, has to do with um, basically how, how involved the medical directors are, how much leadership listens to paramedics. So, so again, um, the IGEL, the, the increase in the rate of IGEL uses is, is, uh, has increased dramatically over the course of this study, faster than the rate of increase um, that we see with the king laryngeal tube. So it, it could be that paramedics really like the IGEL, they favor it over the king laryngeal tube. And so agencies that have leadership, medical directors, chiefs, that, that listen to their members and what their paramedics want and, and are really critical of the, the clinical care that's provided, they could be shifting to the IGEL much faster. And so that could be a confounder that's, that's influencing the results that we're seeing. Um, and, and in addition, when you say, you know, is it time to, to throw away all of our kings and, and everybody move to the IGEL? Um, again, retrospective observational data, there could be a ton of confounding variables that we have not thought of or, you know, could not measure. Um, and so, you know, again, I think this should all be taken with a grain of salt, but it does suggest that, um, that there is some potential influence between these two device designs um, and that we should be doing everything we can to make sure that we're, you know, just practicing good airway management using end tidal CO2 to confirm airway placement, even I mean, with every supraglottic airway device, that should be, that should be a standard. Um, and, and, you know, having a, you know, low threshold of suspicion for pulling devices that may not be functioning correctly. Um, so again, I guess that comes back to the education and training part, not overinflating King cuffs. Maybe that's, that's another. <laughs> no. And, and I think that's a key is, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the, you know, the device is not the silver bullet. It has to do with using the device appropriately, recognizing unplanned extubation um, and doing those things that we should be focusing on. And I, I can't reiterate what you said enough is focusing on the capnography, working on minimizing hypoxia and hyperoxia, and these things that we know are associated with poor outcomes. Uh, so not just putting all of the reliance on, well, I got the right piece of plastic, so everything's going to be fine from here. There's still a lot of things that we need to focus on. And you mentioned hyperventilation. That's a uh, hugely um, unmeasured because it's somewhat challenging to measure variable in cardiac arrest resuscitation and then uh, add on the mix with tidal volumes and uh, research saying you know, too small of a tidal volume is not really great either you know, if we're leaving the bottom of the lungs not inflated um, and how we release the bag even matters. Are we doing the slow release? Are we doing what we're supposed to quick release on the bag? Um, so all of these techniques come into play and are, are a key part of cardiac arrest resuscitation. Yeah, um, there, there, so, was the, there was the Bonnie Snyder paper that came out this week that looked at right. small small bags associated with uh, less return of spontaneous circulation. So Right. And and there's some interesting case studies on that too, of, of using a small bag and, and for people who ended up paralyzed, but not fully sedated, remembering that they felt like they didn't get a full enough breath that bottom of their lungs weren't inflating and the complications that that can cause. So I think there's still so many questions that we don't know the answers to, and I'm glad that we have people like you taking them on. Um, and so that's just for our listeners to say, you know, no study here is definitive, but this is adding to our knowledge base and adding to our critical thinking around how do we want to implement these in our own EMS systems. Um, so I have that unpopular task. I'm going to invite back Tony and Michael for any last round of comments before I have to sign us off. An hour just flew by. This is such an interesting paper and so many interesting components to it. So um, very excited that we had this opportunity. I'll turn it over to Tony first. Yeah, I just want to again uh, commend you. This is great work um, and uh, I'd look forward to seeing where this goes in the future, but it's certainly um, a great study and a lot of hard work you put into this. So thank you for doing it and thanks for spending some time talking to us about it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Great work, Tanner. Hats off. The great research. Love seeing when we can recreate studies. This has been recreated a couple times and the data continues to push us in the same direction. So um, the service person in me says, OK, we need to start seeing if our agency should be it's a systems approach. We want it to be good at everything. But if an easier eye gel makes life easier on the system, then maybe there's something to that. Absolutely.
And I will also give you the last word, Tanner, before I carry us out. Any last things for our audience to keep in mind or anything super exciting that you have that you want them to stay tuned? He put in his Twitter handle. I highly suggest following him because Tanner is one of the most productive researchers that I've ever had the pleasure of working with, and you should definitely read all of his work. All right, yeah, so th thank you all very much for listening. Um, I think there's there's one takeaway if you're interested in getting involved in, in EMS research. It's as simple as, you know, sometimes sending an email to a registry, ESO. Uh, I know they they take uh, project proposals, um, CARES. So if you have any any ideas, I mean, this, this was this study probably took a total of, you know, maybe 16 hours beginning to end to finish it. So um, it's with with some some simple statistics and some simple simple methods, it's possible to have some impactful research, uh, if the, at least if the Twitter debating is any uh, is any indicator. <laughs> Absolutely. Twitter debates lead to more research projects, and I love it. Um, and I, it's as if I paid you, though I did not. I don't have a conflict of interest to mention that the pre-hospital care research forum has uh, events for those of you who may be interested in getting into EMS research where we provide those pieces that help you get things done in 16 hours, which is having a trained methodologist and a statistician in the room, um, having access to a data set. So the next one of those is coming up in May. You can check it out on the PCRF website at www.prehospitalcare.org um, and definitely highly encourage, like Tanner said, more EMS clinicians involved in research, the better um, helping us answer the many, many questions that this study probably raised, as most good studies do, they make us ask more questions. Um, so I just want to say thank you one more time, Tanner, for sharing your time with us. I know that being in an MD-PhD program is a huge time commitment, and the fact that you chose to share some time with us and our audience is wonderful. Um, so thank you for that. Anytime. Careful what you say. You'll be back. <laughs> um, but now I have the unpopular task of getting us out of here. So I do, before I go, want to remind you all that we're going to have the education version of this Journal Club podcast on Friday, October 27th. And we'll be back here with our clinical podcast second Monday of the month, as always. That will be November 13th. Uh, thank you all again for your participation and for all of your wonderful questions. Let's keep the conversation going on Twitter, which I refuse to call X. Um, and look forward to seeing you all again next time. Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this PCRF Journal Club. Please share it with other interested EMS professionals. An archive of past journal clubs can be found at pcrfpodcast.org. You can also find us on Facebook at PCRF at UCLA and on our website, prehospitalcare.org. A special thank you to our sponsors, Limmer Education, providing educational tools for success at every stage of your EMS journey, and ESO, dedicated to improving community health and safety through the power of data. Mm -hmm.